In this video, we discuss the concept of concepts of internal energy and specifically how work relates to changes in internal energy. Uh, we start with a simple definition of internal energy, um, typically given the symbol U, um, including all internal motions of particles that would include translational motion, vibrational motion, rotational motion that might occur for molecules. An important thing um, associated with internal energy is that it is what is called a function of state, uh, which means that changes in internal energy depend on the initial and final states. How we get from the initial to the final state is unimportant. Um, so, for example, if we start with state A with internal energy U sub A and go to state B with internal energy U sub B, it doesn't matter how we get from A to B um, in a straightforward path going straight from A to B or in some kind of convoluted roundabout way that the family circle kids might take, um, the actual change in internal energy is independent of that path. It is the same for both of these, um, and it's just simply equal to the internal energy of B minus the internal energy of A. Now, this will become important as we go through many different computations because we'll find that sometimes the actual process may be might be quite, quite complex. But if we can take that actual process and devise, even though it might be imaginary, an imaginary series of steps that gets us from the first uh, initial state to the final state, um, and it turns out that those imaginary steps are far easier to compute, um, then we will do that. It will make our lives a whole lot easier, make comp many computations a whole lot easier. So we have this way of calculating delta U based on the initial and final states in our process. It's also important to note, as we discussed earlier uh, in an earlier video, that the delta U for the universe is going to be equal to delta U for the system plus delta U for the surroundings. Most of our computations are going to be for a system, but we will find that we will need in certain circumstances note what the changes are in the surroundings as well. We'll talk about that in a later video. Uh, now, we've been using delta for change here. Um, it's important to note that when we deal with processes where there is a continuum of changes going on within that process, we need to be using a more exact differential form, and that's what we have here, um, where the differential form uh, means that each of the changes, for example, du universe, as we see here, corresponds an infinitesimal change in the internal energy of the universe um, that will express it that way. And to get our final answer for a uh, finite process, we're going to have to do some integration. All right, so let's take a look at um, individual or different types of energy that are associated with changes in internal energy. Um, there is, of course, heat which is represented by the symbol Q, and that's a kind of a disordered random form of energy, as you are probably well aware. Um, and then there's also work, uh, which is an ordered form of energy, and you may remember from physics class um, that we can calculate uh, work for a system uh, by simply using the expression work is equal to force times distance. Now, here we use the differential form of this expression, so an infinitesimal amount of work is equal to negative force, uh, uh, and that would be the external force that we're moving against times the distance traveled. Of course, to get work in any kind of calculation, a finite amount of work done, uh, we're going to have to simply integrate. Um, and this is actually, as an aside, we'll, we'll note that uh, if at any point you're ever unsure what to do in a problem or, for example, I ask you in class, what's the next step, more than likely the answer to that question is going to be integrate. Uh, we'll be doing a lot of that in class this semester. So uh, to get the work done in a process, we're going to have to simply integrate, and we'll be doing specific examples later on. Uh, but one thing that's important to note is that when we integrate dw, we get w. We don't get delta W, which is what we'll typically use for something like um, delta U. However, we will note that while delta U, or while internal energy, is a function of state and is path independent, this is not true of work. Work very much depends on the path. 
um, and we'll find that to be important again as we go through and do some specific computations of this semester. Um, Q is also not a function of state, and we're going to spend another, we're going to spend our time here in this video talking about work. Um, heat is something we'll talk about in the next video in our series. Now, how does it relate to internal energy? It turns out that internal energy changes are, will be equal to Q, the amount of heat transferred, plus W, the amount of work done. Um, or in the differential form, du is equal to dq plus dw. Uh, we re frequently refer to this as the first law of thermodynamics. You may have heard a qualitative expression for the first law, which is simply the conservation of energy in any process. All right. The other thing to note when we talk about uh, q and w is that we have sign conventions um, associated with that, and that is that work is less than zero whenever the system does work. Um, it's going to be greater than zero when work is done on the system, and we'll look at specific examples where that will be clear. Um, and more than likely, you already know that when Q is less, Q is less than zero when the uh, system loses heat, that of course would be an exothermic process. Um, the heat Q transferred is greater than zero when the c system gains heat, and that of course is corresponds to an endothermic process. All right, now let's look at a specific kind of work. There are all kinds of different types of work, um, and uh, we'll, we'll meet some of those later in the semester, but we're going to start with what's called PV work. Um, this is a work associated with the compression or expansion of gases. So let's consider this particular diagram here, which shows a cylinder filled with gas um, at some pressure, and there's a piston with some mass sitting atop, uh, atop it, such that the pressure associated with the mass pushing down on the piston is greater than the pressure inside the cylinder. Now we have these mechanical stops here um, that actually will prevent the um, uh, piston from falling until we remove them. Um, so let's what we've got is a situation where we do have an external force that's due to the mass and, and of course, gravi gravity uh, pulling the mass down, um, uh, putting that pressure on the gas itself, and we want to calculate the work associated with the piston pushing on the gas and compressing the gas. Um, so we start with a simple equation here that we saw earlier, dW, and in this case we're going to, instead of using S, we're going to use Z. Um, because we're going to define the z-axis as being the vertical axis here. And in this situation, what we're going to do is we're going to remove the first mechanical stop and let the piston fall until it hits the second mechanical stop. It will, at that point, when it reaches the second stop, it will have compressed the gas, and that means that um, the, the conditions of the gas, the volume of the gas will change, the pressure and temperature may also change depending on other conditions, which we'll discuss a little bit later on. Um, so we, here we have our differential expression for work in terms of force times the change in, in the displacement associated with the piston um, compressing the gas. Okay. Now, we'll go back to our definition of pressure being equal to force divided by unit area, so therefore force is equal to the external pressure, and it is important when we talk about work, we're talking about work against an external force, so we're not talking here about the pressure of the gas internal to the cylinder. We're talking about the pressure exerted on the gas by the mass sitting atop the piston. So we can make that simple substitution uh, for, for work, and we get this expression here. And then we'll also note that area, which is, would be the cross-sectional area of the cylinder, um, if we take the area multiplied by the change in position, the displacement dz, that's equal to the volume of gas that's been displaced. So that would be this entire volume of gas in here that's been displaced as the piston comes down that we see down here in the bottom diagram. That uh, volume change we're going to be representing by the cross-sectional area times the distance traveled. Um, and in differential terms that's A times dz and that is the definition of volume. 
So we're going to make that substitution, and as a result, we get an expression for work that's equal to negative pressure external. And again, I cannot emphasize this enough. It is the external pressure that we're using in these calculations, not the internal pressure of the gas, except under special circumstances that we'll discuss in a few moments. Um, and of course, to get the work done, we must then integrate that expression, where the limits of integration would be the initial volume and the final volume. Okay, so now we're going to look at some specific processes and, and show how these expressions work out for different types of processes associated with the expansion or compression of an ideal gas. The simplest one is a constant volume process, and that would be a situation where the piston doesn't move at all. Um, the volume of the gas before and after the process would be the same. Um, in that circumstance, because the volume change is equal to zero, dW, which is equal to negative PdV, is also going to be equal to zero. So for a constant volume process, the result is the work done is equal to zero. Very simple. Wish they were all that easy, right? All right, let's talk about a constant pressure process. Now, the constant pressure process might correspond exactly to the illustration we had on the previous slide, where the pressure of the, where we have the mass sitting atop the piston, and we have these mechanical stops. So we remove the mechanical stop from the top, and we see the piston, as a result, collapsing or compressing the gas because the external pressure is greater than the internal pressure. So we see that situation where we move the first stop, the piston falls, the gas is compressed because we have this external pressure due to the mass sitting atop the piston being greater than the internal pressure. And that's how we get to our final diagram, as we discussed before. Now, this is indeed a situation because the mass is the same in both the initial and final states. Throughout this compression, the process, the pressure, external pressure, is the same. And it can be a very violent thing. You can imagine if you've got this external pressure sitting atop um, our gas and, and it's greater than the internal pressure, when we remove that mechanical stop, we see that piston plummet rapidly um, until it's stopped again at the final step. All right, so we refer to this as an irreversible process because of this rapid, very violent plunge that occurs. It's not something that's easily reversed. Um, we'll talk this, about this with respect to reversible processes in a few moments. Um, and so in this case, when we go through and calculate the work, it's actually quite simple because we go to our expression, work is equal to the integral of negative P times dV. Uh, because the pressure is constant, we can move that outside the integral, and now we have this simple integration that work is equal to negative P times the integral um, dV, um, and that's just equal to the pressure times the change in volume that occurs, and so for this simple re irreversible process, the work is just equal to the external pressure times the change in volume. It really can't get a whole lot easier than that, right? It really just becomes a plug and chug calculation. Would that they were all that simple. All right, so let's talk about this with respect to a reversible process. In the irreversible process, we had a very sudden change. The pressure was constant throughout the process. It was um, turbulent, um, sudden change that can't easily be reversed. A reversible process is one where the pressure, external pressure, is changing throughout the process, and in order for it to be reversible, it has to be a situation where it's essentially in equilibrium with the surroundings throughout, and that means that the pressure change that occurs throughout the process must be infinitesimal. So you can think of a reversible process as proceeding uh, through a situation where the external pressure is changed through steps infinitesimally um, so it could, if we had a situation where the external pressure increased slowly with infinitesimal steps, which means that it would take, in reality, an infinite amount of time, then because it's a slight infinitesimal change, 
it can be reversed by an infinitesimal change in the opposite direction. So the reversal process is a slow process which occurs through infinitesimal steps. And as you can imagine, there's really no such thing as a truly reversible process. However, many very, very slow processes are essentially reversible, and we can use the equations developed here to try to compute changes in those particular systems. So in this case, because we've got these infinitesimal changes in the external pressure, you might imagine we get an infinitesimal increase in the external pressure. So the external pressure compresses the gas by an infinitesimal amount, and the gas pressure increases by an infinitesimal amount. So what we have in these very slow reversible changes is a situation where the external pressure and the internal pressure only differ by an infinitesimal amount at any given point, and so we can essentially say that the external pressure is essentially equal to the internal pressure, and then we can take the internal pressure and stick it into our equation for work. This will make our life easier for doing some of these calculations for very slow reversible processes. So let's talk specifics about an isothermal reversible change, and we're going to assume an ideal gas here. Um, later on we'll talk about what happens um, with a, a real gas, not in this video, but in later videos, uh, but we're going to start with an ideal gas. Now, again, since we have this situation where the internal pressure is roughly equal to the external pressure in the case of a reversible process, we'll use the ideal gas law, and we'll substitute that into the equation for work. Um, and so we have this expression here. All right, simple substitution. Now, when we integrate that, what's important to note is because we have this isothermal change in this process, means the temperature is constant. So that also means that in this situation, the NRT, N is the number of moles, that remains constant through the process. R being the gas constant is obviously constant. And again, because it's isothermal, isothermal means constant temperature. Um, that would also be constant. So we can move all three of those outside the integral, and we're simply left with this integral dV over V. Now, if you remember your calculus, this is a pretty straightforward integral. 1 over x dx, integral 1 over x dx is just the natural log of x. So proceeding with this, we find that when we have an isothermal process, the work is equal to negative nRT times the natural log of V final over V initial. Again, it's a straightforward equation. Once we know how we get it, we can use this to calculate the work for these isothermal processes. It is important to note, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on, that we will always find that the negative work reversible is always greater than negative work irreversible, uh, which means that because when the system itself does work, uh, when the system is doing work, and the system would do work for an expansion process. Um, so, and actually, let me let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, in expansion, uh, we're going to find that the final volume is greater than the initial volume. And if the final volume is greater than the initial volume, then we're going to also find that the natural log of V sub F or V sub I is going to be greater than zero. So when the natural log of V sub F over V sub I is greater than zero, that of course means that work is going to be less than zero. And again, that's what we noted before when the system is doing work. The system does work when the gas pushes back on the surroundings and expands. That is the system doing work. So an expansion corresponds to the system doing work, and when the system does work, the work is less than zero. In a compression process, we're going to note the opposite. In the compression process, V sub F is going to be less than V sub I, so when V sub F is less than V sub I, we'll note that the natural log of that ratio is going to be less than zero, and that will mean then under those circumstances that work 
is greater than zero. So during a compression process, work is greater than zero, and that's due to the fact that the surroundings are now doing work on the system um, in compression. So again, just to reiterate, um, compression is due to the surroundings doing work on the system, and for compression, we'll note that work is greater than zero. In expansion, the system is doing work on the surroundings. So in expansion, we'll note that work is less than zero. All right, this slide here shows the isotherm. Um, we talked about this in a previous uh, video, um, which where we have pressure plotted along the vertical axis, volume along the horizontal axis. In a constant temperature process, um, we see the pressure volume change associated with that. Let me back up here for a second. Um, so when we see that process, now we can do a comparison of reversible versus irreversible work um, just to reiterate what we said in the previous slide. Um, All right, so in this situation, uh, we'll note that if we take, if we look at an irreversible process where the, during the expansion, the work is equal to negative external pressure times a change in volume, well, that actually corresponds to the area of the curve, under the curve, associated with this rectangle. If you think about, if you take a look at this, the height of the rectangle is the external pressure. The width of the rectangle is, the, is actually the volume change from the initial volume to the final volume. Um, compare that to what we get for the reversible process, and what we'll note for the reversible process um, is that the area under the entire curve is equivalent to the work done. Because remember, um, we had the equation, and let me just write that again here, the work associated with the process was equal to the integral of PdV. And if you remember from calculus, what we're talking about is an integral represents the area under a curve if we plot pressure versus volume. So that is indeed what we have here. We have plotted pressure versus volume. All right. If we integrate pressure versus volume from the initial volume to the final volume, we simply get the area under the curve. Um, and so that is the entire area indicated by the green hash marks in this situation. And clearly, the area associated with the hash marks is much greater than the area associated with the rectangle that we had for the irreversible process down here. So again, what we will note is that because the area associated with the reversible process is greater, then we get more work from reversible expansion than irreversible expansion. So that actually for engineers is important if you're trying to design an engine that generates the mo maximum amount of work and is most efficient. You want that process to be as close to reversible as possible. And as we noted before, it's impossible to get a truly reversible process, but we're trying to design something that is, that is closer uh, as close to reversible as possible because that's going to give us the maximum amount of work out of the system. Okay, so this ends our discussion of internal energy and work associated with internal energy changes. In the next video, we're going to talk about heat associated with internal energy changes and also deal with work associated with different types of processes involving transfer of heat. Stay tuned.